the eighth grade. It's Miss Chase. Today I'm going to be reading you a chapter from this book, which is the absolutely true story of disaster in Salem. This chapter title is called chapter eight, The End is Near. Oh my gosh. All right, let's read here. On the morning of June 10th, Bishop was loaded into a cart surrounded by guards and officers on horseback and was driven away from the Salem town prison down prison lane. The procession then headed towards Salem village, past crowds of gawking onlookers, and after crossing a bridge, it wound its way to the top of a ledge above a salt marsh. As Bishop continued to proclaim her innocence, guards wrapped her skirt around her feet and tied it tightly at the bottom. Then Essex County's high sheriff, George Corwin, made her stand halfway up a ladder where she was blindfolded and a noose was placed around her neck. Ooh. Corwin kicked the ladder out from under her and the noose jerked tight. She was hanged by the neck until dead. Hmm. On the very same day, a man named Thomas Brattle sent a letter to a gentleman in London. He made no mention of Bishop's hanging, but he wrote a few words about the other goings on. He said, when witches were tried, several of them confessed a contract with the devil by signing his book and did express much sor sor sorrow for the shame, for the same, and said the tempters tormented them until they did it. Well, this was important because by now so many people were accused of witchcraft and they figured out that they would not be hanged if they confessed. Like Reverend Paris's slave um, Tichuba, all they had to do was say they were sorry. In the end, 49 people confessed they were witches. The next part of Brattle's letter revealed some foolish shenanigans going on in the court. All right, listen to this, this is his letter. It says, at the time of the examinations, before hundreds of witnesses, strange pranks were, were played. Sometimes the afflicted took pins out of their own clothes and thrust them into their flesh. Many of these pins were taken out against the judge's own hands. Thorns were also thrust into their flesh. The accusers were sometimes struck dumb, deaf, blind, and sometimes lay as if they were dead for a while. And then all of these things were foreseen and declared by the afflicted just before it was done. So listen to this. There were two girls about 12 or 13 years of age who foresaw that this was done and were therefore, therefore called the quote, visionary girls. They would say, now he or she or they are going to bite or pinch the Indian. And all they were present in court saw the visible marks on the Indian's arms. They would cry out, now look, look, they are going to bind a certain person's legs. And all present would see the same person fall with her legs twisted in an extraordinary manner. Now they say, we shall all fall. And immediately seven or eight of the afflicted fell down with terrible shrieks and outcries, even though the witch was tied up with a cord and the afflicted Indian servant was on his way home, being about two or three miles out of town. Many murders are supposed to be committed in this way for these girls and others of the afflicted say that they can see coffins and bodies in shrouds rising up and looking at the accused, crying, vengeance, vengeance on the murders. Whew, he had a lot to say, didn't he? All right, so on June 15th, this is five days after the hanging, Judge Nathaniel Stalston resigned from the court. He had been totally appalled by its proceedings. Apparently, a growing number of people were beginning to feel the same way because on that very same day, 14 ministers from 12 different towns presented an important message to the court of Oyer and Terminer. It was entitled Return of the Several Ministers, and it was written by a famous Boston minister, a guy named Cotton Mather. This was the author of that scary 1689 book about children with horrible fits. And it stated that special evidence should never be used at all by itself in court. Well, Mather, he believed in this thing called the invisible world, but he also thought the devil could make himself look exactly like an innocent person whenever he did his evil deeds. That way, the devil could lay the blame on anyone he pleased, 
and they would be wrongly commend to death. Well, if the new magistrates were to do their duty properly, Mather wrote, they would only punish people for crimes everyone could see with their own two eyes. Hmm, I wonder what a magistrate is. I'm gonna have to look that word up. So ask yourselves, would the chief justice and his fellow judges on the court of Oyer and Terminer finally read what the document had to say and ban all of these special evidences that were showing up in the courtroom so that these trials could actually be fair? Let's find out. The answer is no. The court did not abolish special evidence. It was obvious from their first trial that to them, evidence everybody could see was simply not necessary. Before long, that guy, Nathaniel Salstron, the judge who had resigned, he was accused of being a witch himself. Hmm, interesting. So the court then convened on June 29th for the final trials of these five women. Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, Sarah Wilds, Rebecca Nurse, and Sarah Good, those five. Witnesses told scores of bizarre tales about these suspects. Their spectators had drowned 13 oxen, twisted a farm hand into a hoop, turned a ball of light the size of a bushel basket, vanished into thin air, choked a woman with nails and eggs, and choked men in bed or tore them to pieces. One suspect had turned into a black hog at a sinful party, and another caused a horse to set a barn on fire. But again, guys, the judges believed every word. All right, so this other woman, a woman named Goody Bibler, she testified that the spectator of nurse, of Rebecca Nurse, had pricked her with pins in the courtroom, but nurse's daughter, oh, let me take this off, guys. Nurse's daughter, Sarah, so um, Sarah Nurse, she testified that she had watched Bibber slip the pins out of her own dress and stab herself with them. So the jury, they found Rebecca Nurse not guilty. But the minute they heard this news, all of the afflicted accusers made a hideous outcry, amazing the spectators and the judges alike. Chief Justice Stoughton sent out the jury a second time. And when they returned, now they pronounced nurse as guilty as charged. So now next up is Sarah Good. Okay, she's also one of the accused. So Sarah Good uh, was, and for a change, some had some evidence from the natural world, not the invisible world, the natural world. And this came into play according to a man named Robert Kalef, who witnessed the proceedings. So these are Robert's words here. He says, at the trial of Sarah Good, one of the afflicted fell into a fit. And after coming out of it, she cried out that the prisoner had stabbed her in the breast with a knife and said that the prisoner had broken the knife when she stabbed her. According, accordingly, a piece of a knife blade was found near the accuser. But immediately, someone informed the court that there was some new evidence. A man named, uh, a man, young man was called who produced a knife handle and a part of the blade. The court saw that it came from the same knife. <coughs> and so when they questioned him, the young man affirmed that yesterday he happened to break that knife and that he had cast away the upper part and that this afflicted person was watching when he did. Okay. So now... Back to Chief Justice Stoughton. He's the one that said he told the accuser to be honest from now on. He had already decided that Sarah Good was guilty and that the use of false evidence did not matter. All right. So now plugging along here. Now it's the morning of July 19th, just one day after the Indian Raiders had killed several people and kidnapped a three-year-old boy not too far from Salem Village. The weather was hot and dry, dry, dry on this hanging day of the five condemned witches. As they rode toward Gallus Hill, each of them prayed uh, fervently with God to, that would, God would prove their innocence. All right, so Susanna Martin, she's a tiny 70-year-old widow. She laughs at her accusers in court and thought they might be witches themselves. 
When asked if she had any compassion for the people um, beset by fits, she said, no, I have none. So Elizabeth Howe, another of the accusers, had exclaimed, if it was the last moment I was to live, God knows I am innocent of anything in this nature. Hmm. And most of the accusers against Sarah Wilde had been about things that supposedly happened 15 to 20 years earlier. So Salem town clergyman, Nicholas Noyles, he's the official minister of these trials. He told Sarah Good he knew she was a witch and tried to get her to make a last minute confession. Sarah Good was furious. You are a liar, she exclaimed. I am no more a witch than you are a wizard. And if you take away my life, God will give you blood to drink. Legend has it that 25 years later, Reverend Noyes died of a hemorrhage, choking on his own blood. Hmm. The women were buried near the hanging site, but as soon as darkness fell, Nurse's family uncovered her body and transported it by boat to be reburied on their own home ground. How nice is that? More people than ever flocked to the hangings on Friday, August 19th, mostly because everyone for miles around had come to see Salem's village uh, the former minister, George Burroughs. So now we have five new condemned witches that are going to get hanged on August 19th. These are John Proctor, John Willard, Martha Carrier, George Jacobs Sr., and Reverend George Burroughs himself. Hmm. One convicted witch was accused from being hanged with the rest. Elizabeth Proctor, so that's John Proctor's wife, I'm guessing, she's pregnant. So she was allowed to just remain in jail. So both of them are accused of being witches at this time, okay? Now, her faithful husband was certainly not let off the hook though. There was huge, energetic, and blunt, this is describing him, John Proctor was the tavern keeper that had been accused by his own maidservant way back in April. After punishing his servant, servant for framing innocent people, including himself, and after calling the witch trials a sham, he had become the first male to be accused as a witch. He had strongly defended his wife too, testifying that, quote, if they, these afflicted girls, were let alone, so should we all be devils and witches. So once he was jailed, John Proctor had written five Boston ministers to say that all of the accused witches were innocent and to describe how torture is being used to make his teenage son, William, and others confess. Of course, his petition did nothing to stop the trials. So John Willard, he ended up uh, fleeing from Salem Village after a warrant was issued for his arrest. And he managed uh, to reach a field he owned about 40 miles away before he got caught. During his examination back on May 18th, he had said, quote, I fear not, but the Lord in his due time will make me as white as snow. So he too never confessed and he approached the gallows with pretty great dignity. All right, so back in May, when the girls in the courtroom had accused Martha Carrier of murdering 13 people and said she was the queen of hell, she had told the judges, it is a shameful thing that you should mind these folks that are out of their wits. Carrier, she was a minister's niece had been jailed along with four of her five children. Her two oldest sons were tortured along with Proctor's son in an effort to make them say that their own parents were witches. Carrier's boys adamantly refused to confess or to blame their mother. For being so stubborn, they had their heels tied to their necks until blood gushed out of their noses. Finally, the oldest said he had signed a black man's book and he accused 19 witches including his own mother. The younger son said he had signed the book too. He reluctantly named three witches, but refused to accuse his mother. It's a good son. So now we're back in August. So on August 12th, a week before 80 year old George Jacobs Sr. was sent to the gallows, Sheriff George Corwin confiscated everything he owned. Off Corwin went with all of Jacobs' cows, pigs, fowls, land, cider, Indian corn, bedding, brass kettles, pewter, furniture, hay, apples, and cider. He even took a horse and even Mrs. Jacobs' wedding ring. This was illegal, you guys. 
the goods that Corwin stole were supposed to support the family of the accused while he was in jail and were be to turned over to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the King of England only after his death. But the government never saw hide nor hair of the booty and neither did Jacob's family. Puritans believed you had to confess your sins before you died if you wanted to save your soul and go to heaven. On the day of the hanging, John Proctor absolutely refused to confess that he was a witch, and he did ask Reverend Nicholas Noyles to pray with him in the jail. Noyles angrily refused in return. So when the prisoners reached Gallows Hill, Proctor and Carrier asked Reverend Cotton Mather to pray with them, and he did. Proclaiming their innocence to the end, they prayed that God would forgive them for any other sins and would forgive their accusers too, so that theirs would be the last innocent blood to be shed. But what about the supposed king of hell, George Burroughs? Despite the risk of being condemned as witches themselves, 32 highly respectable citizens of Salem Village signed a peti peti petition pleading his innocence. It made no difference. The day before the hangings, Margaret Jacobs had paid a visit to Burroughs to admit that she lied when she accused him with her grandfather, George Jacobs Sr. She had already officially petitioned Salem's court to recant her accusations and thereby save their lives, writing that, quote, what I said was altogether false against my grandfather and Mr. Burroughs. The jailers told me if I would not confess, I was to be put down in the dungeon and I would be hanged. But if I would confess, I should have my life. Though she had risked her own life by recanting, it didn't do a bit of good for her grandfather or Mr. Burroughs. Margaret begged Burroughs forgiveness, and it is said that he was kind enough to pray, quote, with and for her. The hanging of the Burroughs is described here by a spectator named Robert Califf. We've seen him already. So this is what Robert Califf says. Mr. Burroughs was carried in a cart with others through the streets of Salem to his execution. Where he's upon the ladder, he made a speech for the clearing of his innocence. And with such solemn and serious expressions, as were the admiration of all present, he concluded by reading the Lord's Prayer so well and with such composed and reverency of spirit that it drew tears from many and it seemed that the spectators would rather hinder the execution. That's kind of nice. Puritans believed that a true wizard could not possibly say the Lord's Prayer without making a mistake, but Burroughs recited it perfectly. Okay, here's what Robert Califf also says. He says, the accusers said the black devil stood and told him what to say. As soon as he stopped speaking, Mr. Cotton Mather, remember he is a minister, being, mouthed upon a whore, being mounted upon a horse, addressed himself to the people to declare that Burroughs was no ordained minister and to convince the people of his guilt, saying that the devil has often been transformed into the angel of light, then that this did somewhat appease the people. So the executions went on. So when Burroughs was finally cut down, he was dragged by the halter to a hole between the rocks about two feet deep. His shirt and breeches had been pulled off, so an old pair of trousers of one who had been executed was put on his lower parts, and then he was taken in the hole together with Rillard and Carrier. One of his hands and his chin and a foot of someone else's were left uncovered. So gross, you guys. All right, so now we have a new person. Um, Giles Corey. This is a cantankerous 80-year-old farmer who had testified against his wife, Martha, appeared at his final hearing on September 16th and pled not guilty. He refused to put himself on trial by jury, and some people say he had a good reason. Corey knew he wasn't a witch, and he had no intention of confessing in order to be set free. So if he went to trial, he would surely be found guilty and all his property would be taken away, leaving his family with nothing. So perhaps that's why Corey did a very stubborn thing. He decided to, quote, stand mute and would not utter a single word in court no matter what happened. Under the laws of New England, anyone who refused to talk could not be tried, but the punishment for remaining silent was far worse than being hanged. It was a type of torture known as piene forte et dior. 
This meant the prisoner would be forced to lie down on his back while more and more weight was piled on top of him until he either agreed to be questioned in court, confessed, or died. Those are his three options. So on Monday, September 19th, Corey was stripped naked and a big board was set down on top of his chest. Then as the town folks stared, a large number of extremely heavy rocks were piled one by one onto the board. Corey had only one thing to say. He asked to have more weight added so that he could die faster. But it would take two long days for him to breathe his last. Caliph, that spectator who had written about Burroughs hangings and reported that horrible detail about Corey, this is what he said. His tongue being forced out of his mouth, the sheriff with his cane forced it in again when he was dying. He was the first in New England that was ever pressed to death. Corey was buried in an unmarked grave by Butt Brooks as if he were as if it were a suicide. But some people were greatly upset about the way he had died. Public opposition to the witchcraft trials began to pick up speed. So, a couple days later, Thursday, September 22nd, turned out to be the last time anyone would hang on Gallows, Gallows Hill, but nobody knew it yet. So the final victims of the witch hunt were Mary Easty, Martha Corey, Margaret Scott, Alice Parker, Anne Puttyter, Wilmot Red, Mary Parker, and Samuel Wardwell. So we got eight more. So those eight prisoners were jammed into this single cart, which bumped its way all the way up that hill back to the gallows. The overburdened vehicle was so heavy that it got stuck in a rut and almost turned over. Rowdy spectators started crying out that the devil hindered it. And what were the last words of the condemned? Well, respectfully, Mary Easty, uh, the high, she was a high intelligent mother of seven children, and she was actually the sister of Rebecca Nurse. She wrote a well-reasoned, humble petition to the governor and judges urging them to rethink their procedures and to stop con condemning the innocent. So this is her pet petition. It says, I petition to your honors, not for my own life, for I know I must die, but with the hope that, I, that no more innocent blood may be shed. I do not question that your honors work to the utmost of your powers to uncover witchcraft and would not be guilty of innocent blood for the world. But by my own innocence, I know you are working in the wrong way. The Lord knows that I shall honestly say at heaven's tribunal uh, seat, I shall honestly say at heaven's tribunal seat that I know not the last thing of witchcraft. Therefore, I cannot, I dare not lie and by, not, by doing so, I have lost my own soul. I beg your honors not to deny this humble peti petition from a poor, dying, innocent person, and the Lord will bless your endeavors. Well, her plea went unheeded. So what about the other seven people on the list? Well, according to that sub um, spectator, Robert Califf, Martha Corey, protest member, her husband, Giles Corey, he died by the pressing, Martha Corey, protesting her innocency, concluded her life with an imminent prayer upon the ladder. Her husband, Giles Corey, had been pressed to death just two days earlier. And Margaret Scott had been framed by rumors that a dying man said he would never be well as long as she lived. Then there was Alice Parker, who had been accused of bewitching a girl because the girl's father wouldn't mow her grass. Guys, we're just this is just getting weird, isn't it? So Parker's accuser, Mary Warren, received permission from Judge Stoughton, that guy again, to strike partner Parker for lying. But Warren had a dreadful fit instead. Okay, so now the next lady, Anne um, Puttyter. She was the wealthiest person to get hanged and was accused of making a man fall out of a cherry tree and making ointments to use for sorcery. Wilmot Red, he was this gruff, unpopular fisherman, uh, or, I'm sorry, Wilmot Red was a gruff, unpopular fisherman's wife from a place called Marblehead. Mary Parker had yelled at her husband for going to a tavern and had also been accused of bewitching a sick child. Parker insisted that she was accused because someone else had had the same name as her. And then, last but not least, we have Samuel Wardwell. This was an eccentric carpenter, fortune teller, and magician who had first confessed that he was a wizard. 
then changed his mind and recanted. When Wardwell tried to declare his innocence on Gallows Hill, smoke from the hangman's pipe set him to coughing. This prompted the afflicted girls to declare that the devil hindered him with smoke. As usual, hard-nosed Reverend Noise was not one bit of sympathy for the people who were hanged. What a sad thing it is to see eight firebrands of hell hanging here, he proclaimed. And about that time, it began to pour down rain. And that is chapter eight.